So you think you know propellers. Here's the thing about propeller physics that every boat owner should know. Your prop is creating controlled implosions underwater thousands of times per second. While you're cruising at 30 knots, your propeller blades generate vacuum bubbles that collapse with a thousand atmospheres of pressure, eating away at your expensive bronze or stainless steel. This phenomenon, cavitation, costs billions in damage annually. But here's where it gets wild. Those $3,000 racing props you see pros running aren't eliminating cavitation. They're managing it for speed, trading longevity for performance in ways that would make your wallet weep. Stay tuned to find out why this is all relevant to you. Let me blow your mind right off the bat. Propellers don't push water backward to move you forward. I know, I know, that's what everyone thinks, including that know-it-all at your marina who's always giving unsolicited advice. What's really happening is far more elegant and, frankly, a bit magical. Your propeller is actually a rotating wing, just like on an airplane, except it's spinning through water instead of air. Each blade creates lift by generating a pressure differential. Low pressure on the forward surface, that's the side facing the boat, high pressure on the aft face. This pressure difference literally pulls your boat forward while simultaneously pushing it. It's Bernoulli's principle meets Newton's third law in an underwater dance that would make physics professors weep with joy. Here's the kicker though, the efficiency of this process tops out at around 65-70% to in the absolute best case scenario. That means even with a perfectly matched prop, roughly a third of your engine's power is creating turbulence and heat behind your boat. Makes you wonder about alternatives, doesn't it? Well, turns out props are still the best compromise we've got for most applications. Jet drives even less efficient at around 50%. By the way, if you're finding this deep dive into prop physics fascinating, hit that subscribe button now because we're about to reveal why the most expensive prop might actually be the worst choice for your boat, something the manufacturers definitely don't want you to know. Now let's dive into something that'll get the dock experts arguing until sunset, blade count. You've got your three-blade traditionalists, your four-blade performance crowd, and those five-blade folks who swear by maximum grip. Here's what they're not telling you at the prop shop. Three-blade props are the speed demons of the marine world, offering 5-10% to better top-end speed than their multi-blade cousins. Why? Less total blade area means less drag, but here's the controversial part. They also create more vibration at certain RPMs due to uneven pressure pulses. With three blades, you get a pulse every 120 degrees of rotation, which can set up harmonic vibrations in your drivetrain. Those mysterious rattles at 3,200 RPM? Yeah, might be your three-blade prop hitting a harmonic frequency. Four-blade props spread the load more evenly with a pulse every 90 degrees. They give you 15-20% to 20 better hole shot, improved handling in rough water, and smoother operation. The trade-off? You're losing those 2-3 to three miles per hour on the top end. And here's what nobody mentions. The extra blade can create interference patterns with your anti-ventilation plate at certain trim angles. I've seen boats lose grip in turns because the fourth blade disrupted the water flow pattern around the lower unit. Five-blade props are where physics gets interesting. Maximum blade area means maximum grip. We're talking 25% better acceleration than a three-blade. But they're also creating more friction. And here's the engineering reality nobody discusses. Beyond five blades, you hit diminishing returns hard. The blades start interfering with each other's pressure fields. Six-blade props exist, but they're basically expensive conversation pieces unless you're running specific military applications. All right, let's talk pitch, and I'm going to explain this in a way that'll finally make it click. Pitch is theoretically how far forward your prop would move in one rotation if it were screwing through jello. A 21-inch pitch prop should move forward 21 inches per revolution. Should. In reality, props slip, like 8-15% to in optimal conditions and up to 40% during hard acceleration. 
This slip isn't a defect. It's absolutely necessary for the prop to generate thrust. Without slip, you'd have zero acceleration capability. The water needs to be accelerated backward, and that requires the prop to be moving faster through the water than the boat is moving forward. Here's where people mess up catastrophically. They think pitch is constant across the blade. It's not. Modern props use what's called progressive pitch, where the pitch increases from the leading edge to the trailing edge. That 21-inch marking, that's usually measured at 70% of the blade radius. The actual pitch varies from maybe 19 inches at the leading edge to 23 at the trailing edge. The rule of thumb that actually works, every inch of pitch change alters your wide open throttle RPM by about 150 to 200 RPM in the opposite direction. But here's what the formula doesn't tell you. This relationship isn't linear. Going from 19 to 20 inches might drop you 150 RPM, but going from 24 to 25 might drop you 250 RPM because you're entering the range where the engine stops struggling against the load. Cupping is where propeller design enters the 21st century. It's a curved section on the trailing edge of each blade, typically extending a quarter to a half inch, and it manipulates the water flow in ways that weren't even understood until computational fluid dynamics came along. That little cup does three critical things. First, it adds effective pitch without changing the geometric pitch essentially giving you free pitch at high speeds when the cup starts working. Second, it helps hold water on the blade longer, reducing slip by up to 3%. Third, and this is the game changer, it allows the prop to maintain grip at higher trim angles and engine heights. The military figured this out in the 1960s when they needed props that could handle 70 plus knot speeds without ventilating. Heavy cupping was the answer, but here's what's fascinating. Too much cupping can actually create its own problems. Excessive cupping causes the water to separate from the blade surface prematurely, creating what's called flow separation. You end up with a prop that grips like crazy up to a certain speed, then loses efficiency. It's like hitting an invisible wall at 45 miles per hour. Still with me? Good, because understanding this next part could literally save you thousands in unnecessary repairs. Make sure you're subscribed, because we post deep dives like this every week, cutting through the marine industry BS to give you the real story. Let's clear this up with actual science. Ventilation is atmospheric air reaching your prop. The blades spin in air instead of water. Thrust drops to near zero, engine over revs. It's dramatic, but rarely damaging because air doesn't have enough mass to stress your components. Cavitation is completely different. It's water vaporizing due to local pressure dropping below vapor pressure. At sea level, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But drop the pressure enough and it'll boil at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what's happening on your prop blades. The vapor bubbles then encounter high-pressure water and collapse violently. We're talking about pressure spikes of a thousand-plus atmospheres concentrated on areas smaller than a pinhead. That's what eats through stainless steel like it's butter. Here's the mind bender. There are actually four types of cavitation. Bubble cavitation, random bubbles, sheet cavitation, smooth layer, cloud cavitation, unstable sheets, and vortex cavitation, spiral vortices off the tips. Sheet cavitation is actually beneficial in some cases, reducing friction drag, but when it transitions to cloud cavitation, you're looking at serious erosion damage. Your skeg does way more than protect from rocks. It's a hydrodynamic control service that affects prop efficiency more than most people realize. That vertical fin creates what's called a pressure recovery zone behind it, helping organize water flow into your prop disc. The engineering here is precise. The skeg needs to be exactly the right distance from the prop to prevent turbulent flow while not creating excessive drag. Most skegs are positioned two to four inches forward of the prop, and that spacing is calculated based on water velocity and pressure gradients. Here's what happens when you damage or modify it. Disturb that pressure field, and you can lose 5-10% to of your thrust efficiency. But it gets worse. An incorrectly repaired skeg can create asymmetric flow into your prop, causing one blade to work harder than the others. 
This imbalanced loading leads to premature bearing wear and can actually crack your gear case over time. Forget generic advice about matching your prop to your boat. Here's the systematic engineering approach that actually works. Start with your engine's power curve data. You need to know where peak torque occurs, not just peak horsepower. Most outboards hit peak torque around 4,000 to 4,500 RPM, while peak HP is at 5,500 to 6,000. You want a prop that lets your engine operate in its peak torque band during acceleration and reach 95% of maximum rated RPM at wide open throttle. Test systematically using GPS for speed. Boat speedometers can be off by 10 to 15 percent, a proper tachometer for RPM, and a fuel flow meter if possible. Document water conditions, load, and trim angle for every test. Change one variable at a time. This is scientific testing, not guesswork. The secret metric nobody talks about. Slip percentage equals theoretical speed minus actual speed divided by theoretical speed times 100. Optimal slip is 8 to 12 percent at cruise, 10 to 15 percent at WOT. Higher than that, you need more blade area. Lower than that, you've got too much prop and you're lugging your engine. Here's where the real engineering comes in. Understanding your boat's resistance curve versus your engine's power curve. Your hull has what's called a hump speed, where it transitions from displacement to planing mode. This typically occurs around 1.5 times the square root of your waterline length. For a 20-foot boat, that's about 6.7 knots. Your prop needs enough pulling power at 2,500 to 3,000 RPM to push through this resistance peak. Miss this and you'll be stuck in the hole, burning fuel going nowhere. The diameter-to-pitch ratio tells you everything about a prop's personality. A ratio below 0.6, like a 13-inch diameter with 23-inch pitch, is built for speed. Uh, think Greyhound. Above 0.75, like 15-inch diameter with 19-inch pitch, is your workhorse. Think Bulldozer. Most recreational boats perform best between 0.65 and 0.70, balancing acceleration with top speed. Water density matters more than you think. Fresh water weighs 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, salt water about 64 pounds. That 2.5% difference means you can run about one inch more pitch in salt water with the same RPM. Temperature counts too. Water at 50 degrees F is 0.5% denser than at 85 degrees F. Testing your prop in spring versus summer, you might see a 100 to 150 RPM difference just from temperature-related density changes. The most overlooked factor? Blade Area Ratio, BAR, the total blade area divided by the disc area. Racing props run 0.33 to 0.55 BAR for minimum drag. Workboat props run 0.55 to 0.95 for maximum thrust. Your typical recreational prop sits around 0.45 to 0.55, but if you're consistently loaded heavy or pulling skiers, bump up to 0.55 to 0.65 BAR for better grip without changing pitch. Aluminium props use 356 T6 aluminium alloy typically, which has a tensile strength around 35,000 psi. That sounds impressive until you realize stainless steel props use various grades ranging from 15 to 5 pH, 170,000 psi tensile, to 17 to 4 pH, 190,000 psi tensile. We're talking about 5x the strength. But strength isn't everything. Aluminium's lower modulus of elasticity, 10 million psi versus stainless at 28 million psi, means it flexes more under load. At wide open throttle, an aluminium blade can deflect enough to change its effective pitch by 2 to 3 inches. You're literally running a variable pitch prop without knowing it. The latest innovation, nickel aluminium bronze, NAB alloys that resist cavitation erosion 3x better than stainless. The military has been using these for decades, but they're just hitting recreational markets at prices that'll make you question your boat ownership choices. 
For maintenance, here's what actually matters. Check for fishing line after every trip. It can saw through seals in hours. Inspect for stress cracks at the blade roots. That's where 90% of failures start. And never, ever ignore vibration. A prop even slightly out of balance creates forces that multiply exponentially with RPM. Mercury Marine claims their Revolution 4 props use exclusive X7 as a marketing name for a slightly modified 15 to 5 stainless that's been around since the 1960s. Yamaha's Shift Dampener System It's a rubber hub that Honda was using in the 1980s. The real innovation is happening at companies like Sharrow Marine with their loop blade props. Completely different physics, 9-15% to efficiency gains, or row J props using computational modeling to create blade designs impossible to manufacture just 10 years ago. Powertech deserves credit for actually publishing their blade specifications, rake angles, cup dimensions, progressive pitch ratios. Most manufacturers guard this data like state secrets, but it's geometry, not magic. Price reality check. Material cost for a stainless prop blank is about $40. Machining and finishing adds maybe $100 to $150 in actual cost. That $800 prop? You're paying for development costs, marketing, and massive dealer margins. The boutique manufacturer is charging $2,000 plus. At least they're using 5-axis CNC machines and actually optimizing blade geometry for specific applications. The number one error is running wrong engine height. For every inch you raise your engine, you reduce drag by roughly 5%, but you also increase cavitation risk exponentially. The sweet spot? Anti-ventilation plate running 1-2 to two inches above bottom at speed. Verified with a pressure gauge showing 15 plus PSI water pressure to your engine. DIY prop repair is usually disaster. Blade geometry tolerances are measured in thousandths of inches. File too much off one blade trying to remove a nick and you've created an imbalance that generates harmonic vibrations. These vibrations fatigue metal following whirler curves. What starts as invisible stress becomes catastrophic failure without warning. The smartest investment, a proper spare prop tested and documented for your typical load condition. Not your buddy's hand-me-down, not a great deal from a swap meet, a known good prop that matches your engine's operating requirements. Your propeller converts rotational energy into thrust through complex fluid dynamics that NASA still uses supercomputers to model. Every design is a calculated compromise between competing requirements. Acceleration versus top speed, grip versus efficiency, durability versus performance. The marine industry profits from keeping these physics principles mysterious, selling upgrades that are really just different trade-offs, and capitalizing on misunderstandings about basic hydrodynamics. But now you understand the actual science. You know that blade count affects harmonic balance, that cupping manipulates pressure fields, that cavitation erosion follows predictable patterns. Most importantly, you understand there's no universal best prop, only the optimal solution for your specific combination of hull design, engine characteristics, and usage patterns. Find that combination through systematic testing and data analysis, not dock gossip or marketing claims. Every rotation of your prop involves forces that would have seemed impossible to harness just a generation ago. Respect the physics, maintain your equipment properly, and it'll deliver years of reliable performance. Ignore these principles and you'll join the crowd at the parts counter, credit card in hand, wondering why boats are so expensive to maintain. If you found this deep dive into propeller physics valuable, hit that subscribe button right now. We decode marine engineering mysteries every week, bringing you the unfiltered technical truth about boats, engines, and the science that makes them work. Ring the notification bell too, because next week we're exposing why your boat's fuel consumption gauge is lying to you by up to 30%, and the actual physics-related methods to measure real consumption. Until then, keep your props balanced and your engines within specified RPM ranges. This is your source for real marine engineering knowledge, signing off.